So, so the funny thing about conferences like this where people come to try and, and learn things is to some degree it's people preaching to the choir, right? Uh, I, I'm a lifer, ultimate, all aspects of my life have been touched by ultimate, and I think you guys are kind of the same. And so the, the idea of me kind of standing up here and trying to convert you in some way to, to you know, some aspect of coaching or administration, you guys are all already there, right? Like the, just that, that breadth of programming that this small group is involved with is amazing. And, and in some ways, what I'm going to talk about is, is breadth, because I think in general, the theme of, come on, the theme of this um, conference uh, and the talks today is going to be about coaching. There's, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are here to get very specific tips about uh, both coaching itself and, and the, the program of coaching. My talk is a little bit broader, and in some ways now I wish I was going at the end of the day to try and tie things together. But um, given my background which, uh, and um, present, which I'll talk about in a minute, I'm going to try and give the big picture within which coaching exists um, and kind of more of a long-term view uh, because I think the rest of your day should be focused on coaching and really focused on the kids like Maggie and Bo were, were talking about, but there's a bigger context here um, that coaching fits into and is actually the foundation of. Um, and I'll try and help you understand how we think about that at USA Ultimate and how I think about that um, as a coach, as a player, as a parent, um, I've kind of done every role there is to do an ultimate. So, um, oops, sorry. So at the bottom are kind of the organizations I am or have been very involved with in the past in ultimate. So I'm the, the president of the board of USA Ultimate. Um, I have been uh, for basically the last five years. I've been on the board for the last 10 years. Um, so I've seen USA Ultimate as the governing body for the sport in the U.S. grow from uh, about 10 to 15,000 players when I came in in 2004. This year we'll go over 40,000. Um, for the first time in terms of members, that's totally unrepresentative of the U.S. in terms of participation. There's over 5 million people playing Ultimate regularly in the U.S. So U.S. Ultimate is just a small slice of that, but we feel like we have a big charge in terms of visibility and setting up structures and helping people like you set up structures so that, um, so that the sport can flourish. So we're proud of the fact that we, that we have 40,000, but it's just a bit. Um, and I can talk more about U.S. Ultimate and how we work with coaching and all aspects of it, um, if you like. Revolver, I'm the head coach of Revolver. If you don't know what, Revol what Revolver is, um, it's the top um, club men's team in the world uh, and in the country. Um, we won nationals last year. We've won nationals three times uh, over the course of the last four years, and we've won uh, worlds twice during that time. Uh, it was a program that I helped start in 2006. I played for it for uh, five years, retired, and then came back to coach this last year. Um, Stanford, I played for five years in the 90s, um, made it to finals and nationals three times, never won as a player. Uh, sadly, I'm the Jim Kelly of College Ultimate, um, for, the, for those that know who Jim Kelly is. Um, uh, but then I came back and, and was the first head coach of the Stanford men's program starting in 2001. And in 2002, we won nationals for the first time since the first college nationals in 1984. And I've kind of stayed very close to that program, coaching on and off since then. Um, and then finally, Ultimate Peace. Miranda's next door talking about Ultimate Peace, which uh, most of you know about. Um, it's trying to teach values to, uh, to kids through Ultimate, largely uh, in the uh, Israeli-Palestinian um, area, or area, pardon me. Uh, and I was involved in the first two programs for Ultimate Peace. Went over in 2005 to Israel to kind of test the concept. And then we went back in 2009 to do the actual first real Ultimate Peace camp. Uh, and then I had kids and... and uh, disappeared from the face of the earth for a few years. So hope, hoping to get back involved with Ultimate Peace. So, so the point here is, just like you guys, my life is Ultimate. I met my wife, who's a top competitive player through Ultimate. Um, I've been playing and coaching and involved for 20 years. Um, and I really believe it's given me a lot in life. It's, it's basically done everything for my life as a foundational element for me. Uh, and so it's really important in my mind to give back. And a lot of what I'm doing now through USA Ultimate and through Coaching Revolver is trying to live that. So. You saw the, the subject of the talk. I mean, the analogy <laughs> uh, is we are here, right? Um, we, we are May 25th, 1961. It's a point where uh, there have been a lot of issues going on, of course, in the country. There was World War II. There was the Cold War that came out of that. Um, a lot of concerns about uh, kind of the future of the country. Um, I think some people would say that things eroded during the 60s. You guys, you, you know, an ultimate crowd may disagree. Um, but the, you know, what Kennedy is doing here is basically laying out the path and laying out a challenge to the country 
um, to unify around a vision of putting a man on the moon by the end of the 60s. Um, and, and I really believe, literally right now, we are at that point with ultimate. And the whole point of this talk is to think bigger than just ultimate. Um, and we really, so we do this at USA Ultimate. We specifically talk about these things. We actually talk about it on Revolver, too. Um, the, the, the general theme of this talk is that uh, there's a bit of a crisis right now, and the timing couldn't be more perfect. Um, so this is from, I believe it's yesterday's Wall Street Journal. Uh, very visible article in yesterday's Wall Street Journal that basically called out the <coughs> fact that um, in the last, what is it, um, seven years, uh, six years, there are less um, kids playing team sports. Um, and this, there's been, you know, spot statistics on this um, over the course of the last, you know, uh, on and off over the course of the last six years. But um, this is the first time where it's really getting a lot of visibility. And there's a lot of, you know, hypotheses why we can talk about those. And I'd love to get your guys' input on that um, and maybe brainstorm a little bit about it. But there's a crisis happening. Um, you know, some of it may be kids prefer other al uh, alternatives that are not sports related. Um, I think there's some aspects of this, though, that are around um, a lack of appreciation among kids and also parents for what team sports currently is teaching our kids and what it's providing. Um, who here has heard of or seen Friday Night Tykes? Oh. Yeah, a few. So, so Friday Night Tykes is a series that, uh, it's a TV series that's on the Esquire network, which I had never heard of. Um, the fact that Esquire has a network is a little weird. Um, <laughs> But it, it basically is following, um, I believe it's middle school age and younger, uh, all the way down to like eight or seven and eight year old kids in the Texas youth football leagues, American football. Um, and it's, it's just shocking, right? Um, you have coaches that are, you know, lit Bo was being funny, mostly, um, in, in the presentation about berating kids. But like, this is a show where, where you know, coaches are making eight year old kids run laps for hours. Right. If you remember that movie Miracle, where Kurt Russell is the head of the 1980 hockey team, he makes his you know almost professional <laughs> hockey players skate for hours. That's a different story, right? But basically, making these kids cry, making them incredibly sore, um, and I've seen a lot of blog activity about that um, series and debating whether or not it's glorifying that type of um, behavior or you know vilifying it. And the Esquire Network has been a bit coy about it. I think possibly they actually thought it was going to be, um, you know, it wasn't going to be vilified quite as much as it is. Um, but, you know, shows like that are, are really bringing this issue out, I, I think, into the public um, consciousness. So, and so I think, you know, part, part of this today is, in my talk, is talking about ultimate as, um, well, let's talk about this. So I've got a few. <clears throat> I've got injury as a concern, right? We've got football, sure. definitely a big concern. A lot of publicity recently about um, CT within football, mm -hmm. et cetera. Expense, I think that's a big problem for, for parents. Um, and that's tied with the thing below inequality. There's a lot of data which suggests that there's a lot of racial inequality in team sports um, in terms of access. And that has to do with finances, but also um, geography and, and several other factors. And then there's the moral concerns about what uh, is the competitiveness of team sports um, teaching our children right now? Um, what other? Well, let me let me stop and ask. Do you guys agree there's a crisis going on, yeah. just in the broader kids sports culture? And you pick problems right there that Ultimate has good, you know, a good response to. Yeah. I mean, are there other ones major problems? You know, I don't. Not that I can think of right off. Yeah, Tina. I think one of them is sort of a, a win at all cost mentality that if my child isn't going to make the high school team or that he's not going to get a college scholarship, why should we be investing in him playing at a younger age? So it's more and more like if my child's not set to play at the next level, yeah. why play now? And yeah. not recognizing the immediate benefits. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think that falls into one of those categories, but we see that all the time. And also in this country, there's hmm. no playing opportunities for kids who don't make you yeah, know, right. murals, like no club system like they have in Europe, you know, that sort of thing. So if you're not the top, the opportunities run why do you Why do you think that happens? Why isn't there kind of a lower, why aren't there lower tiers at anymore? Those, at those ages? Yeah. 
Unfortunately, I think it is a lot of it is sort of the dream for the college scholarship and mm-hmm. the glorifying of a professional career in totally. sport and making your money from your sport. And if that's not the case, why do it? Yep. Yeah, I was actually just, uh, and, and I'll come back to you guys with your hands up. I, on that point, I was just um, on a, a, a weekend trip with some um, Stanford teammates of mine from 20 years ago. Uh, and we were talking about the whole debate that's happening right now about college athletes getting paid. Right, and many of you may have seen that they're um, looking to unionize uh, the college players to basically go after the NCAA to get paid a portion of the media sponsorships that the NCAA gets. Um, and for me, this is a big deal because it really extends down into this idea of it's all or nothing. Mm-hmm. Right, you, if you have a high school kid looking at that, it's no longer I go to college so I can make it to the pros and make money. It's you know I have to be a top level high school athlete to make money in college. Mm-hmm or nothing. I'd rather play on the chess team or, you know, um, be a video game champion or whatever it is. Bama, for football, unless you play on these mega travel ball teams yeah. or go into, the, I mean, people move states just to play in youth football programs. It's yep. silly. Yeah, That's right. absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And the other, well, the other thing I'm seeing as a teacher, I work at a very, I work at a very affluent society. It's parents really strive to push their kids to go to good colleges. And, their concerns is not sports. Their concerns is oh, what, what band is he in band? Is he how many how many clubs is my kid in? Mm-hmm. What's the resume? His resume looks so awesome. Yeah. So when he applies to Yale or when he applies to Northwestern, like they're gonna see, oh my kid's in, this kid's involved in ten things. Yeah. And the kid is staying up till one two o'clock in the morning doing homework because he has clubs all up the school, and sports is not one of them. It's, it's all the things that the colleges that. So, so it's an interesting, uh, I'll, I'll come to you in one second. It's an interesting point, but I think we have to believe in ourselves a little bit more about ultimate, and, and also to some degree about sure. sports. So, so the last um, degree, uh, or the last bit of school that I did was at Stanford Business School, and the reason I got in was not my grades. I wasn't quite as bad as Bo in terms of uh, GPA, <laughs> but I, w- I wasn't too far off. Um, but when I got into Stanford Business School, the, the admissions director there basically said, ultimate got you into this program. Um, you know, and part of it was that I had written an essay about it. There was an ultimate player that was um, at Stanford Business School at that point, and she thought that, you know, the, the values of ultimate and the, the state that ultimate was in at that point um, made, you know, somebody who was involved at a, at a high level in, a, in an administrative way a really good addition to the school. Um, you so, got yourself in. Yes, I got myself in. No, but, ul- ultimate got but me. But if you're a parent that you know how ultimate can affect your kid in a positive way, mm-hmm. that's, that's yes. the issue that I have. Yeah. yeah. That's, those are the bears I well, and it's also it's, it's an interesting point, Jeff, because I think that um, in some ways I also decry this idea that you know paying a lot for kids to do sports is a problem. However, I, I, I think about how much Ultimate has taught me about life and about how to be successful in life. I could make the argument that I got a lot more value out of Ultimate than I did out of Stanford University. Which I gave a lot of money to, um, and, and and so it's it's a really tough debate I think for us. You know, there's there's the have-nots, and so there has to be a system where they can get the value out of a sport like Ultimate at a low price. But I but I can't necessarily say that you know um, parents paying a lot for sports for their kids is the wrong thing. I just think it's the wrong thing if those same um, opportunities to learn the values are not available to people of lower socioeconomic status. I definitely think the the, uh, the other problem is that it puts so much pressure on the kid because the parents have thousands of dollars invested on their seven year old kid. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Soccer. And so the parents feel stressed out because they want they need their kid. Yes. To get a scholarship because the money they would have been putting towards college is going towards softball, and that's the way they need to get into college. So it's like it, that money is going to college no matter what. It's just going a different route. So so we're jumping ahead a little bit and. Uh, I'll come back to this, but part, part of the point of today, of, of this discussion that we're having, is, and, and this is tough because most of you spend a lot of time on Ultimate, is you guys need to do more, right? As coaches and as people involved with coaching, it's not the kids, not just the kids. Parents are huge in this. You have to be a, two, you have to be a parent to the parents, right? And we have to, we as the coaching community have to convince parents that it's okay to spend money on kids playing ultimate, but it is not okay to put pressure on them while you're doing that, right? It's a, it's a sunk cost, if you, if you know that concept. Um, and, and that's really important. Like, you are not, 
um, Bo was talking about learning as a coach. That's about, you know, and he was talking about learning how to be a coach to the kids and always improving in that. We, we have to learn how to be like holistic coaches and run holistic coaching programs that influence this whole ecosystem that is around kids. And I'll get to that point in a minute. I think that, yeah, I think that's right. There's, a, there's an attention span problem, right? Which is there's so many opportunities. And in some ways, another way that we think about it at USA Ultimate, which again, I would encourage you guys to have a broader mindset too, is we're in the marketing and sales business in this room, right? And it's not, it's not just with the kids on your team and trying to get them sold on Ultimate. Uh, it's, it's other kids, but it's also thinking more broadly, like how do we publicize what's so great about this sport more broadly, right? And n nobody in this room should be doing the old, you know, kind of ultimate adage if somebody asks you, you know, why you're out on the field, oh, we're playing soccer, right? Or have you ever heard about ultimate frisbee? The nice, the nice thing for me, I hope you guys have experienced the same thing, is in the last 20 years, I've, I've gone from asking that question 20 years ago, you know, do you know about ultimate frisbee? And, and, and most of the answer was no. Now it's like, yeah, of course. Yeah, and so I'm starting to get it finally. I'm getting into the mode where I don't ask that question anymore. I just say, you know, I'm involved with Ultimate. And people know, right? So that's another reason why we're at this great point in time with the sport, right? We can get beyond the dogs and the whammos and the, you know, all this stuff and just move right to the point. You have to give credit to college. Like when I started playing Ultimate, for the most part, it was the kids who couldn't get uh, onto a D1 sports team that would play Ultimate at D1 schools. Yeah. Right. Now you have people like Bo. I mean, Bo, Bo is a, um, I, I coach him right now. He's, he's definitely a D1 level athlete. He may be a pro level athlete too. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he, you know, Bo is a very thoughtful guy. He chose ultimate um, instead of trying to do those things. Sport um, speaks for itself kind of. Is that it, it does, more yeah. Than, more than football. And, uh, yeah, and I, th I, I, think for parent, I think for parents what's happening, Tina, is that you have the you know a couple generations of ultimate players becoming parents, so that's one one contributing factor, and you have this like slowly increasing level of athleticism, um, so the sport looks better. <laughs> so let's keep going here. So that was the problem. The solution, the horse, the Trojan horse. Um, so so this this really is how I think about it, right? I I, I think about ultimate as the Trojan horse for changing the world, um, and and it's. You, you know, I laugh when I say that. You guys laughed a little bit. Um, but it really is true, right, that we have this vehicle. We're at the beginning of it. I think it's about to completely blow up. Um, and it's not about ultimate for me, right? It is about taking the values that I've learned from ultimate that start with the, the whole spirit of the game concept and, and using that to change how people go through their daily lives. Um, and so I think we can use this sport to really change how people think about things. So that's a picture of Bo inside the Trojan horse. Um, I, I wish he was here. Um, so mindset. For me, it's, it's kind of um, just beyond the basics of coaching. And you guys should, of course, spend most of your time thinking about the, the mechanics of coaching. But there's a mindset that sits behind this. And I spend a lot of time thinking about these things. Um, so I mentioned this. Instead of you know, kind of downplaying ultimate like really be proud, right? Like don't count on USA Ultimate to do it. Don't count on the pro leagues to do it. Um, what we need is we need more leaders in this sport, right? When you think about like the US Tennis Association, you know, a massive organization. They're involved with the top levels of the sport. They're involved with grassroots. They're involved with education. They're involved with kids and adults. The number of people who play a leadership role that are associated with USTA and are loud and proud about it is mind-boggling. You know, it's in the tens of thousands over the course of a year. And that's our full membership at USA Ultimate, right? You guys need to think like leaders and you also need to develop other leaders. And to do that, you've got to infect them with excitement, right? So it's not just the kids, it's telling everybody about this and getting them involved. Um, this is a big one for me. Uh, Probably for the first 10 years I was involved, and I started working in the administration of Ultimate, you know, whether it was the, the old crowd or just this feeling that Ultimate was special and we don't want to F it up. Mm -hmm. Right? We have to get over that. We have to be self-confident enough as leaders in the Ultimate community to say, this sport is good enough so that I don't have to protect it. I don't have to keep it a secret. Right? I don't have to cloister it. Um, you know, it is a sport for everybody, and it's going to change. 
right? At, at U.S. Ultimate, we've made some changes in the rules, right? We've shortened the end zones mm -hmm. from 25 yards to 20 yards. The time in between points is shortened. Um, we had to put numbers on our shorts, right? There if if there used to be time games, yeah. And you would not believe when we voted as a board to put numbers on shorts, how much of an outcry we got. You know, and the whole point of that is so that on TV and in, in um, photographs, people can see the numbers and they know who the players are and you can put a, a caption below the photo or somebody watching on TV can tell who it is, right? And, and that was kind of from an era where people were kind of focused on the wrong things and trying to keep it the same as a grassroots sport. We've got to, we as leaders have to figure out, um, you know, what changes are acceptable and what aren't. But I would suggest that at this point in the evolution of the sport, let's let it morph a little bit. Right, both into something that's very visible, um, but let people make it into their ultimate. Um, so, and then the last one in terms of mindset, it's, and I think you guys are probably here with me, but it's not about spirit of the game, right? It is about ultimate values. Um, a few things to say about this. Spirit of the game is a little bit of a nebulous concept, right? Not only from what I said before, it's hard to think about how to apply it, but Nobody really knows what spirit of the game is outside of Ultimate. And we've had a lot of debates about this at USA Ultimate. Do we want every American, everybody in the world, to know what the term spirit of the game means? Personally, as the president of USA Ultimate, I don't care right? if they know. I care if they conduct themselves in a way that I think is helpful for my kids, for my teammates, that helps them grow, helps them have the type of experience I've had. And so it's less about the spirit of the game and hanging on to that term or the specific paragraph, but, all, but really focusing on what the benefits are. Okay, so the engine of change. Um, so I'm going to describe, the reason I used engine is I actually kind of view this, and, and USA Ultimate, um, the leadership views this as a closed system, right? And this, this is the big picture I was talking about. We're here, we're focused on youth for the most part. Um, but there's a much bigger system that we think about here. And if you look at uh, on US, USA Ultimate's website, we have that si uh, six-year strategic plan. We have six goals over the next six years that we're going to execute. And it's trying to, to develop this system that grows ultimate, increases visibility, increases quality. Um, youth is a huge part of that. It actually, when we did our survey work with thousands of people before we released the plan, literally 7,000 people we got survey results from, um, youth was the number one priority. But if you think about it in the really broad context, you cannot grow youth sport at the level that we want to, to millions of people, without a whole lot of other pieces being in place. So this is, this is the system, right? This is the flow that we're used to, right? You play youth level, you go to college level, you go to club. We're kind of focused at the top, but we as administrators at the youth level need to be mindful of what happens after that. Um, if you look in USA Ultimate's strategic plan, goal number one is visibility. It's all about media. And that, that was not the number one thing that survey results told us that members wanted. They wanted youth. That was number one. Youth was number one. But we made a decision to say visibility is number one in our strategic plan. And the reason is that we think it kind of lifts all boats. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is that you not only get um, recognition of the sport so people learn what it is. You get young players watching at the highest level so they're inspired to play more, practice more. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the other aspects that um, kids watching, we hope they will see. But you get parents seeing that it's on TV, seeing that it's a credible sport, seeing the level of athleticism. In our plan, there's a sub goal that is all about teaching spirit of the game through mass media channels. Right? And, and so, you know, people like Bo and Maggie um, need to be on TV, not only making great plays, but talking about, you know, the experiences they've had that are unique to ultimate around spirit, around values, around you know um, participation from within the sport. So we, we have some initiatives that are about um, making examples of teams and athletes and coaches that really embody those values and doing that on TV. So as we're working with ESPN, and we just signed our first um, three-year contract with ESPN uh, last year, so that's a big deal for ultimate. Um, we've been very upfront with them that they need to do features on um, the community and on the values. Um, and they're completely in line with that. Um, one thing for you guys to know that's really important, if you don't know it already, is we'd always assumed, I'd always assumed, a lot of people had assumed that the only way that Ultimate was going to make it onto ESPN or make it to the Olympics 
was with referees. And in theory, that you know somehow means getting rid of spirit of the game. I don't fully believe that, but you know that that we would have to look a lot more like other sports. The number one thing, well, so this past year, um, WIFDIF was recognized by the International Olympic Committee, which is the first step towards the Olympics. Um, we have we help them with that application um, because we're a much bigger organization than WIFDIF, which is the World uh, Flying Disc Federation. Um, and we now have submitted our application just uh, two months ago to the USOC. Um, to get U.S. recognition for Ultimate as a member sport, which is the first step in the U.S. towards being a full member of the Olympic family. They're kind of focused on Sochi right now, but they'll, um, they've told us they'll get back to us with an answer right after Sochi. Um, the one thing, the main reason that the IOC accepted Ultimate as a member sport is because of Spirit of the Game. Uh, well, actually, that one of the things. So Spirit of the Game, if you look at the stated kind of Olympic ideals, as they're called, it, it's basically the same as Spirit of the Game. So they love it, right? No, no other sport has that type of clear statement that aligns with their values as much as we do. The other reason, just so you know, is that, um, and I think you mentioned this, Ultimate is the only sport where at a fairly high level there's co-ed play. Um, and you think about it, the Olympics, there's no sport with co-ed play, and they love that from a viewership perspective, from a values perspective. Um, and so just so you know, we, we at USA Ultimate have the hypothesis that over time the most visible aspects of our sport will be co-ed. Um, and the proven spade work with the World Games, with the mixed team at the World Games over the last few years is under yeah. help with that as well. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. that The reason that popped up, um, it was less because of the, the media, because the World Games isn't that visible. Okay. It's more because there's an athlete cap. And that's the same thing in the, the, the Olympics, right? The athlete village has been capped, I think, at 16,000 athletes, something like that. 16,000, 1,600, anyway. There's, there, yeah. yeah, it's 1,000, right? Yeah, yeah there's, uh, um, there's a cap that, that is consistent over time. And the problem with Ultimate is, you know, you have, all, you have 20 some odd people on the team. And so the way, if we get Ultimate into the Olympics, it's going to be in a World Games format where you've got 13 total players per team or maybe even 10. You play with seven, but you play shorter games. You play a shorter schedule. And then, Mike, the other thing that IOC would like, <clears throat> there's a team cap of the number of team sports that are allowed in each Olympics. Yeah. And I think, is it modern pentathlon where they have horses jumping over things? That's yeah. really expensive to ship horses around the world. So <laughs> I have to imagine yeah. a sport like Ultimate is very appealing because it's a low cost. Absolutely. You know, for the IOC. Yeah, yeah. So. The, with, <coughs> I'm surprised that visibility is the number one priority in the six-year plan, and, and in particular because uh, it, it seems like the development of the pro leagues is based on the assumption that men's elite ultimate is where the marketing opportunities rise, and it seemed like USA Ultimate kind of dropped the ball in terms of getting, you know, the Triple Crown was announced simultaneously with, with the development of the pro leagues and stuff, and, and uh, I don't know if, if the USA Ultimate perspective is let you know, the pro leagues thrive as well. It all raises visibility, but it seems like USA Ultimate got behind the curve because they were still wedded to to the women's division, the mixed division, the masters, and, and so the USA Ultimate mission was broader, and the pro leagues were really trying to target what mm -hmm. we have that's marketable, how are we going to attract the fans, how are we going to make some money out of this? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm, I'm glad you're bringing it up. What your thoughts are about that? I mean, um, so, so... I, of course, will say I don't think we dropped the ball. Um, I, but no, but seriously, I think I, my perspective, um, and it, I'll say it's my perspective. I think a lot of people within the leadership feel the same, is we are fans of the pro leagues, that concept. It's going to happen for sure, as, as, you know, as long as we're doing this work overall as a community. Um, when you think about USA Ultimate, the, over the long term, there's no reason for us to keep this to ourselves, right? The reason that people are involved in the administration of USA Ultimate at this point, up to this point, and I hope it stays that way, is not because of the money. It's because we believe in the sport, right? And, and so there's no, if, if MLU or AUDL is running a great pro league that's, you know, teaching values, visibility, it's growing the sport, and they do that better than us at, let's say, an elite men's level, I'll be the first one to say as the president, let's let them do that and let's do other things. Even if they get rest and they, the spirit is... Well, so, so that, that, you know, if, if we were to believe that getting refs and were to, instead of observers, were to erode, significantly erode the values associated with spirited game, then I think we would say we're not for that. 
right? And we would we would do what we can to um, to prevent them from doing that with with like-minded in individuals. Now there may be a group of people that grow up and say, yes, I want to play ultimate with refs. Maybe we'll we'll do this, right? And there will be ultimate number one with refs. There will be ultimate number two, and we'll call it something else. Um, there will be ultimate number two with observers. I hope that's not true, because it dilutes the character of the sport. Um, I was worried about that until uh, the IOC validated spirit of the game and observers, like I just mentioned, and also ESPN. ESPN, we thought they're going to need refs. And we just signed this three-year contract. They love observers, right? They're the same. They want to have these features as part of their broadcast that describe the value of self-officiating. And so, you know, as I've told that to people, and I've told that to all of the elite players, you know, who I'm in touch with in my role as the revolver coach, all of them are like, oh, okay, that, that debate's over. There, there's nothing more to talk about. Because they can still play ultimate at the highest level um, without, and, and get the visibility they desire. And eventually they will get paid. But it starts to cannibalize itself when, when like, as soon as one top club team stops participating in the fall series. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 so we we are involved in a kind of um, it's not love hate it's a, it's push pull situation with the MLU and AUDL. Um, we currently believe that we have the best product in terms of quality of play um, and long term stability of the sport, and that's important. And the re, you know one one key part of that for us is our relationship with mass media. Um, you know, I think the MLU, I haven't been to an AUDL game, but I've been to MLU game, and, and most of my players on Revolver played for the Dogfish this, this past year, so I'm very close to it. They had some great stuff. I took my five-year-old to the MLU game, and they're shooting T-shirts into the crowd, and, you know, Bo signed a disc for him, which is kind of funny because he goes to practice and sees Bo every Saturday, but he was really excited to have Bo sign a disc for him at the game. Um, but, but they, so they have some good aspects to their product, but, the, you know, for me right now, the plain fact of the matter is that, you know, for, for this piece, ESPN, IOC, USOC, th these powerful organizations in sport which help us, you know, increase visibility, get parent, new parents bought into the legitimacy of this sport, and then <coughs> feed the growth funnel here. Those organizations believe in USA Ultimate, and it's not because we talk a better game, it's because we're stable, right? I mean, we've been around for 40 years, we have a good, we have a good budget, um, you know, we think we have a good plan as far as helping them with visibility. So it's not like we've, we've remained a grassroots sport. The fact that ESPN is willing to work with us, I think suggests that we have a part of our organization that actually can play with the, the big boys, and we are having discussions, literally I'm going to a board meeting in four weeks, one of the agenda items is um, if we're gonna put together a USA Ultimate Pro League, what will that look like? And part of that discussion will be, um, or you know, one option there will be we do it ourselves, right? We tell MLU and AUDL and, and the next generation of those because there's been several generations. We tell them to pound sand. I don't think that's the right way, personally. I think the other option is we work with one of those organizations, empower them, and over time, yeah, we it, it becomes, um, it could become a model like football. You know, bad example because it's injuries and, and all that. But, um, you know, you have USA Football, you have the NFL, and those organizations are working together fairly well, right? So I think that's a possible evolution here. So right now we think that we need to, you know, make sure that we keep the interests of the sport close. Um, and so I've been, you know, it, it's good that I have the role as both Revolver Coach and USA Ultimate because I can help translate that vision back to the Revolver guys. They talk to the other elite teams and, and we kind of get the outcome we need. I think right now there's a good situation frankly, which is the pro leagues are early in the season. They're testing the model, but the top players are still playing, and then they go and play in the USA Ultimate Series. Eventually, it's going to get too hard to do both. Yeah, Jeff. Um, one thing about the uh, media to get to the fans and to get back to the youth, how that whole model works, Yeah. Um, I'm, actually, I'm really enjoying right now is I just started a middle school program out mm. in the Southern awesome. Valley. Yeah. 
Um, a mom is a part of the pickup, so she runs all of the paperwork and all the financial stuff, and then I run all the coaching aspects of it. Yeah. So we have a really good tandem. But the media aspect is my first my first Wednesday. I went. I give every. I give them a uh, like a question of the week, and so hopefully this is they dig into the sport and they get a little prize at the end. So I have an old jersey I have. No <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, which. So little I, things. Uh, which means little to me means everything to them. The fact that I, they can go on and, I mean, we as an older group might be slightly ignorant to social media and Twitter and YouTube and all that stuff, but they are not at all ages. And they know how to get highlight videos, and that's where this sport is. So in the second week, when they do nothing about Frisbee week one, week two, the first thing they are coming up with is trick shot videos. Yeah, and, right. Which, I mean, which is a different... It's part aspect, of it. It's okay. Absolutely. Yeah. It at least puts the... It puts it out there that it is it is real. It's you're right. It's not a bunch of hippies sitting around throwing a frisbee to dogs. Yep. It's a it's a real sport, and there actually are faces to this sport, and there's actual athletes. And when it's on ESPN, it legitimizes the sport into a parent, to a kid, and to a parent, because the parent thinks, oh my god, the sport is somewhat is actually real. It's you're not. I'm not sending my son or daughter away with some. So I'm hippie right. <laughs> to do his hippie things. That, that will never, yeah, and the other piece of that is you're not sending them away to do something that will not pay them back, right? I mean, Tina, you were talking about yeah. what, what's the payoff of doing this, and it's mm -hmm. all or nothing. Um, you know, when I first started playing in college, no, no parents showed up at nationals my first year. Right, not even my parents. Um, and actually, my parents almost never showed up. But, uh, you know, when I started coaching, by, and, and by the time I kind of, the last year I coached uh, Stanford as the head coach was 2008. We had 20 parents at College Nationals, and they had, you know, pre-planned dinners with each other. A couple of them were traveling before and after the the tournament, and and you know the degree to which they were parroting back this idea that ultimate was teaching their kids life skills, it just blew me away, right? Because I mean that that's what I've been trying to tell my parents for for a long time, right? And and so we're amongst the believers, like the message now is starting to be quite clear. And now we just need to grow that. I have, Frank. A, I have a really cool long story about, so at Franklin this year, we actually got varsity status for our principal. Even wow. though it's not like a state official sport like WIAA. Yeah. Uh, the principals can decide to give like varsity letters and et cetera. Huh. And the reason we got varsity letters is because we played at uh, Spring Rain, which is that big youth, Northwest mm -hmm. uh, youth tournament. And my kids... They have, they're very loud and they're really spirited. And uh, we, are, we have this big chant in the beginning of the game. And a parent from like four fields over heard us and was so intrigued, walked over and then watched us play the entire game. Watched one of my kids, Henry, who played on the 2012 juniors team. And uh, just loved his spirit. Hmm. And like there was one of our younger classmen like made a, mistake, a huge mistake, big point loss. And he came over and talked to him in front of his parent without knowing, knowing his adults watching. Yeah. He had this great cup talk with him. And then can came to play and cheer. And then that woman, that parent wrote like a three-page letter to our principal hmm. and to our board of supervisor. Like I like sent it to everyone. Hmm. And so like, good. So just talked about how amazing it was. And the principal loved us since then. Yeah. And you know, and so it's, it's fascinating. Like what one, just like spirited play, like what that does when parents see it or the people that are willing to talk about it. Yeah. Just finding right. ways in social media to like amplify that. Yes, yeah, and that's and that's that kind of sub initiative that we have, you know, where and we'll really start ramping it up this year. Like we need stories like that, frankly. Yeah, I mean, we should do that at the, at the local level, at the grassroots level. But like, you know, I think we'll have an effort where we can basically have an inbox and say, you know, submit your stories that we can showcase at the highest levels. Yeah. Through, you know, your whole life. I mean, I, I, it's a great question. I th I think that um, the the sport sells itself, but you have to get exposure, right? And, and the fact that you just said that you don't interact with that many, you're a coach, right? You don't interact with that many parents. That's a problem. Not to point, point you out, but I'm pointing you out. Um, you, you know, and I asked you guys to do more. What you have to do more of is you have to do whatever you can to have more contact with parents. You have to get them to practices. I mean, you, like literally think creatively. What are the incentives to get those parents out there? Right, anything you can do, pay them. Um, but 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 to Frank's point, like you, those parents have to show up. They have to see a practice conducted. They have to see, you know, that type of values-driven episode. It takes thirty seconds, but they have to be there to witness it. 
Mike, just a quick add on that. I yeah. think sometimes in situations where people are working three jobs, it's hard to get them to practice. It is. But if yeah. part of what you can do is talk to your athletes about taking something home. Totally. And talking yeah. to their parents about it so their parents see the impact. Yeah. Um, that is a way to get through to some people who aren't going to come to the games. Or totally. Play. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's an empathetic view to this ecosystem, right? And fans includes parents and, and kids and people who, you know, are not involved, who hopefully will get involved. So parents are in here. But it's... It's putting yourself at the center of this and being empathetic to, you know, to all this, especially to parents and saying, okay, what's their mindset around ultimate, right? And how can I communicate with that? And maybe it's sending something home. Maybe it's getting them out there. Maybe it's, you know, you mentioned, you know, the fact that we're not, people in this room may not be as social media friendly or social media knowledgeable as kids, but it's our responsibility probably as coaches to pick out a few things online, go search them out and say, okay, here, here are the three things that I think really personify Ultimate. I don't know that much about Snapchat, right? But I can point you to these three websites. And you tell that to every kid and every parent you meet, right? And I'm, by virtue of the fact that you guys are here, you, you are invested enough that, that you want to do great things in this sport, right? And so the question is, you know, can we grow? At USA Ultimate, since I've been involved 10 years, we've grown from two full-time staff members to now 15. 15 people in, the, in that office make their living on Ultimate. There's more people throughout the world. Most of them are actually in that office. Um, but, but that next layer down of people who are volunteers mostly, but they spend a boatload of time on Ultimate, that needs to grow also. And you guys need to be part of that. right? I mean, I, I'm a busy guy. I'm an executive at a startup. I've got two kids. I spend 10, 10 to 15 hours a week on Ultimate. right? I don't sleep much. But, but you know, it's given me so much that I feel like I have to give back, and I love doing it because I see what it does. Right? And, and, and this, is like, this is what we've been talking about. You guys as coaches, if you want to make that commitment, right, if you want to be that next layer down from kind of full-time doing it as a job, it's not just coaching. right? It's all these organizations here that you, number one, base level, you need to be aware of. You need to be aware of what they're doing. You need to connect your kids into this system. But you also, in a lot of these cases, need to be connected with these entities, right? If you're going to do this effectively, you need to know the people at Parks and Rec. You need to know the revolver players in your, you know, the club players in your area and bring them to practices. The same with college, right? To know, um, to bring players in and know where you want to send them. The Area Disc Association, the school, right? The governing body, the media outlets, right? Next Gen and ESPN for us. You have to be plugged into that. So I think that's important. So, so by the way, we start out with this. You guys probably thought I was analogizing myself to JFK. That's complete BS. Um, th this is you guys, right? This is you sitting here saying, I'm going to make the commitment to, to change and, and make a big impact. So no, that's where we'll get. Thanks, Mike.